As Christians, we are disciples of Jesus. And we learn in our gospel lesson today about the first few disciples, at least John's account of how these first few disciples came to be followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus. And so we're going to take a look at this account, specifically the latter portion of that gospel reading, and see what it means for us today as well as for them back then. And so my first question for you today is, what, what pops into your head when I say follow? For me, for my generation, for, for many people, it's probably one of these pictures. Following me on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube or any of these things. At social media, a lot of the point of social media is not just to connect with people, but to have as many followers as possible. The followers back in that day, though, were a little bit different. It wasn't just something you could pop up on the computer and maybe get a laugh at or two. But following someone meant you looked to them as a guiding force in your life, as a person that you, you wanted to learn from, you wanted to know what they knew so that your life could be better as well. Through our reading then of the gospel and, and the actions of the disciples, there's three words I think that stick out that we're going to focus on today. And these three words are follow, seek, and remain. And so the first one, follow, follow Jesus. This act of following Jesus actually starts before the disciples made a decision to follow Jesus, before they really knew what was going on. It started with the man that we heard about in the first portion of our gospel lesson today with John the Baptist and the witness and the testimony that he gave about Jesus. And so it's the same for all of us. Before we made whatever decision it was that we were going to come to church, that we were going to be Christian, we first have the word proclaimed to us and the spirit comes to us. Before we know what's going on, before we make a decision and creates that faith in our hearts that then responds to the proclamation of the gospel, to the proclamation of whoever brought you to faith, whoever gave you that first word. And so faith and following Jesus actually begins before we know anything about it. It begins with the proclamation of someone giving us the word and the Spirit causing that faith in our hearts. But again, before following Jesus, something else had to happen for the disciples of John. They had to stop following John. They had to turn from one to the other. And based off the account of John, based off what he said, they decided that Jesus would be the person that they would follow instead of John. They turned to someone greater, someone they had been told is greater. And so my question for you then this morning is what do you need to stop following in order to follow Jesus? What are the things in your life that you look to for guidance, that you look to for meaning, that you look to in troubled times, in bad times, that you follow instead of Christ and instead of Jesus? What do you need to leave behind? What's keeping you from fully following Jesus? I think as we find, though, that as we leave those things behind, as we turn to Jesus and begin to follow him, we begin to see the things that Jesus is doing. We follow him not only to the temple where he would preach and proclaim, we follow him to the streets where he would minister to the poor, the hungry, the sick. And so this life of following Jesus isn't one of just coming to church and being in the church, but of going and doing the things that we see Jesus doing throughout his ministry as well. As the disciples then hear this proclamation from John about who Jesus is, they turn and they follow Jesus. And our text says that Jesus noticed them. He turned and noticed them. Uh, is this a little bit weird for you guys? I don't know. Reading it the first time, I thought, well, how did the disciples follow him? Did they kind of like creepily from 100 yards back just do one of those? Or were they really close on his heels? I don't know. However it worked out, though, Jesus turns to them. He sees they're following him. And he asks them a question. Now, this question is, are the first words that are recorded from Jesus in the Gospel of John. They have great significance for the few that were following him then. And I think they have great significance for us today as well. Our translation that was up on the screen said, what do you want? Jesus asked them, what do you want? Another translation says, what are you seeking? What are you seeking today? Because all of us are seeking something. That's why books like The Purpose Driven Life sell so well. They say you're seeking purpose in your life. You're seeking whatever it is. And I have that answer. I can tell you how to get what you're seeking. What are you seeking today? Happiness? Peace? Fulfillment? Now, none of these are bad things, but when we look anywhere except to Christ 
for that fulfillment of those desires, when we seek those desires anywhere but Christ, we won't find them. C.S. Lewis has a great quote about this. He says, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it isn't there. There is no such thing. When we seek anything besides Jesus first, it ultimately leads us to a dead end. And it leaves us wanting something more. And so we seek Jesus. But how does that work? What does that look like? Well, Jesus actually tells us later on in the book of John, or I'm sorry, in the book of Matthew, in Matthew 6, 33, he's talking about all the things that people desire in this world, all the things that people worry about. They worry about food, clothing, what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to wear, things that, that, that you would worry about in your everyday life. And Jesus says, you're seeking after these things, you're putting these things first in your life. What you should do is seek my kingdom first. Seek my righteousness first. And then all these other things that you're seeking will be added to you. You see, when we seek Jesus first, he promises he'll provide for us. Maybe not give us all the wealth we could ever want in the world. Maybe not give us 10 course meals every evening. But he promises to provide for us when we put him first in our lives. So back to our story then. The disciples follow Jesus. He turns and says, what are you seeking? And I think maybe the disciples were a little bit dumbfounded by this question. They put yourself in their place. They've, they've been studying with John. They've been following him around, baptized by him, all these things. And he gives this great proclamation. This is the one I was telling you about. This is the one who is greater than me. The Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. This man, the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world, asks you, what are you seeking? Wouldn't we expect something like, well, take away our sins, or are you the Messiah? We're seeking the Messiah, something like that. And yet they say, where are you staying? Where are you going tonight? Where are you going to be tonight? Uh, maybe they were a little bit dumbfounded. It's not exactly what I would expect when Jesus asks you a question. Maybe not what all of us would expect. But I think it's, a, it's an appropriate response when you stop and think about it. Where are you staying? You see, everything John had just told him, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, the Messiah, this was in their heads. And so they just wanted to spend time with him. They wanted to be with him. That's why they followed him. They wanted to be his disciple. They wanted to learn from him. They called him rabbi, teacher. They knew he had things to teach him. So they follow him and they say, I just want to spend time with you. I want to remain with you. See, they recognize who Jesus is and they desire to spend that time with him. And so Jesus tells them, well, come, spend time with me, come and see. That's an incredible invitation. The disciples had no idea what they were getting into. But think of all the things that they then went on to see. The works of Jesus. They saw lame men getting up and walking. They saw the blind receive their sight. They saw the dead rise again. They saw Jesus ascend into heaven. They say all these, see all these crazy things that they, they never would have thought of. They stay with Jesus then. They follow him. They remain with him through the good and through the bad. Through the times when he was teaching and, and people loved him and the crowds were adoring him and through the times when the crowds hated him and called him crazy or demon-possessed and wanted to stone him. But even through all of this, they stay with Jesus after Jesus is crucified, after Jesus rises, and after Jesus ascends into heaven. Or maybe it's more accurate to say Jesus stays with them. He promises in this scripture portion from John 15, this is the one later on in John, where he talks about how Jesus is the vine. He calls himself the vine, and the disciples are the branches. They don't have life. They don't have meaning. They don't have purpose if they're separated from the true vine, from their source of life. And so he says, if you remain in me, not only will you have life, but I'll enable you to do good things for the kingdom of God. Like the disciples back then, for us today, if we remain in Jesus, if we remain in his teachings, we too are enabled to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And that's how we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, spending time remaining with Jesus. And we do this first and foremost through the power of the Holy Spirit, through prayer, that he enables us to have through communion with the Father. We do this through our scriptures, our study of scriptures, our daily devotionals, through coming to communion like we're about to experience it here today. 
or through remembering our baptism, like Pastor Girdle talked about last week, maybe in the morning when you take your shower, however you remember your baptism. These are the ways that we remain in Jesus and in his teachings. And so these three things follow, seek, remain. They're not just one-time endeavors. It's not like a check that off the list, okay, move on to the next one for the Christian life. But it's something that we, we strive to continue every single day. We follow Jesus in doing the things that he does, in ministering to our community, to the people around us, the people in need, the people that need it. We do this through seeking God, through our study of the scriptures, through asking those hard questions that we want the answers to. Asking maybe not only through prayer, but asking people that have some theological knowledge, the pastors, the people among us, lay leaders, things like that. We continue to learn to know more about God, to seek him. And then we remain with God by coming to church, by experiencing all the blessings that he gives the church, the sacraments, the community of believers that gathers together. And so I encourage you today to take these three things through, with you throughout the week. Follow, seek, remain. See how you can put them into practice in your life, in your walk, in your discipleship. And so as this week goes on then, I pray that the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding would guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you then to